Uh, welcome everyone to our faculty-led panel today, um, led by MFA faculty, Peter Rostovsky. Uh, this is the first of our public programs here at the Leslie MFA June 2022 residency. I'm the director of the program, Ben Sloat. We start our program with a land acknowledgement. Leslie University here in Cambridge resides on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Massachusetts people whose name was appropriated by this commonwealth. We pay respect to the Massachusetts peoples and their neighbors, the Wampanoag and Nipmunk peoples who have stewarded this land for generations. And we offer our appreciation to the lands and waters for sustaining us. Uh, today's Father's Day. So we wanna acknowledge that to all the fathers out there. Um, and, but it's also Juneteenth. And so I'd like to share a statement uh, gleaned from a Juneteenth proclamation of 2021 when it was consecrated as the newest national holiday in this country. On June 19, 1965, uh, sorry, on June 19, 1865, nearly nine decades after our nation's founding and more than two years after President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, enslaved Americans in Galveston, Texas, finally received word that they were free from bondage. As those who were formerly enslaved were recognized for the first time as citizens, African-Americans came to commemorate Juneteenth with celebrations across the country, building new lives and a new tradition that we honor today. In its celebration of freedom, Juneteenth is a day that should be recognized by all Americans. It is a day in which we remember the moral stain and terrible toll of slavery on our country and a long legacy of systemic racism, inequality, and inhumanity. But it is also a day that reminds us of our incredible capacity to heal, hope, and emerge from our darkest moments with purpose and resolve. Together, we can lay the roots of real and lasting justice so that we can become an extraordinary country to all Americans. Juneteenth not only commemorates the past, it calls us to action today. Our general thematic for this June 2022 residency is Imagine Worlds, which considers how the landscape of the fantastical and the imaginary can be a place of liberation, or relief, or expression within the realm of art, but also reflects the increasingly prevalent space of cultural delusion. Our programs continue tomorrow with a talk by mixed media painter Chie Fueki, Tuesday by Decorva Museum senior curator Sarah Montrose, Wednesday with mixed media artist Candace Lynn, and Thursday with visiting faculty Del M. Hamilton. I hope those watching the YouTube live stream on the front page of our website can join us for those programs. Uh, today's program is led by MFA faculty, uh, faculty Peter Rostovsky. Uh, and here's Peter's bio. Peter is a Russian born artist and writer who works in a variety of disciplines that includes painting, sculpture, installation, comics, and digital art. His many, his many projects attempt to bridge the gap between painting and conceptual art while remaining attentive to painting's history and especially to its encounters with new technologies. Um, recently, Peter has expanded his practice to explore comics and graphic fiction. His work has been shown widely in both the United States and abroad and has been exhibited at such venues as the Walker Art Center, MCA Santa Barbara, PS1 MoMA uh, Art Pace, the Santa Monica Museum of Art, the ICA Philadelphia, the Boynton Museum of Art, uh, SMAC, the Municipal Museum of Contemporary Art Ghent, and a host of private galleries. In addition to his artistic practice, Peter also writes art criticism under the pen name David Gears, focusing on the convergence of art, politics, and technology. His writing has appeared in October, Philip, Bomb, The Third Rail Quar Quarterly, The Broken Rail, and Freeze. Uh, meanwhile, Peter Rosowski's comic works have appeared in Topic, Unbag, The Third Rail Quarterly, and then Devil's Due, political comics featuring AOC, Bernie Sanders, and The Squad. His contribution to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the Freshman Force was highlighted by the New York Times, Artnet, Vice, and other media outlets. And Rosowski currently teaches uh, not only here at Leslie MFA, but at New York University and Parsons New School. And please join me in welcoming Peter Rostovsky. Wow, thanks, Ben. You should have, we should have really cut that down. <clears throat> okay, thank you, everyone. So I'll give a brief introduction on my work. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, lead into our uh, illustrious panelists, uh, who, as I mentioned, we are very, very fortunate <clears throat> to have for this event. So um, let me uh, do this. We're on. <clears throat> so I promised that I would introduce myself in five succinct minutes. Uh, so here it is. Please uh, forgive me for reading. One, I am a painter, although some comic friends of mine introduced me as a cartoonist and I'm flattered by that designation. I still identify as a painter passionately. Although uh, 
it, it must be said that when we fled the Soviet Union in 1980 and settled in the Bronx, I fell in love with comics. And so my earliest love for art and reading came from this medium. The 80s also happened to be an especially good time for comics. When I make paintings, they tend to look like this. Atmospheric, photographically derived, reflecting on loneliness. Uh, you can see that uh, thematic here. Uh, and the void, however you want to see it, whether uh, as the sublime, uh, a wandering through the abyss that acts as a political allegory, or some other impasse or negativity, frustrating sight, if not reason. Uh, however, since I started making comics, my paintings started looking like this, or this, or this. Two, I am a writer. Although it took me a long time to come to terms with this affliction, it is what I do, unprompted despite any financial sense, and regardless of whether there's a publisher on the horizon. I started writing criticism under a pen name, David Gears, for magazines like October, Bomb, The Brooklyn Rail and Freeze, and this pen name allows me to keep my criticism distinct from my visual practice. Although of course, the wall between these identities is riddled with holes. Still, as I wrote, I explored writing beyond art criticism and eventually sought to unify my two personas. Comics as a synthesis of writing and images is one such space that allows these halves to join and mix in something more animated, perhaps more forward-looking and primordial than what painting or writing allow separately. Three, I am invested in public art because I grew up under the illusions of the communist regime and the spell of the historical avant-garde. I believe in art as a form of access, but also a demanding one. This led me to make digital art whose files were freely distributed online and art objects whose price went down with production. This also led me to make public art in uh, open spaces and schools in marginalized neighborhoods. Comics for me represents a key form of such public art, what I call capillary action, mass distributed but advanced form that echoes productivism, Bauhaus and other vanguard experiments. Four. The more I pursued these thoughts, the more it distanced me somewhat painfully from painting. But as my work became engrossed in the dynamics of the comics page and migrated to a digital platform, all my work, uh, including this, is done on the tablet, the more I discovered something else after painting. Perhaps it is film, something kinetic, dynamic, synesthetic that comics allows. Painting suddenly seemed frozen like statuary I recalled once to an art critic friend of mine. This is actually my former editor, Dan Fox. But this immersion in sequential imagery, in this immersion in sequential imagery, I also discovered a lyrical and humorous voice as a writer. And uh, these are pages from my forthcoming book, uh, Damnation Diaries, due out with Uncivilized Books uh, next year. Uh, and it's a political satire that follows a sinner in hell who after 300 years decides to get therapy uh, with Fred Greenberg, uh, hell's only therapist. And, uh, you know, it's a dramedy uh, and it's visually very elaborate. And it's influenced by artists like uh, Bernie Wrightson, uh, Gustave Doré, uh, Francois Scuiton, um, you know, classical art like Dutch uh, Caravaggism. Uh, wonderful painters working in the comics field, uh, like uh, John J. Muth, uh, more digitally inclined artists like Andrea Sorrentino, uh, and many others. And I must also note that, uh, you know, in this artistic transformation, I also discovered the community of cartoonists whose passion for their craft and medium continues to inspire me. Good comics make me go, wow, and this innocent but irrefutable reaction demands that I follow it. Five, I have not abandoned painting, but with conversations like this, seek to build or illuminate the bridge between these disciplines, as well as these different communities. Again, access. Within comics and fine art, we are artists all, writers too, working within our respective spheres. So selfishly, I now seek that holy grail, the medium that could perhaps unite these different modalities. 
for me, comics has been it thus far. But I'm also curious to see what other pathways it opens up back to the tableau or through the museum to the page or to the digital scroll or some other sphere that we barely perceive in that void, fertile space or gutter connecting word and image. And gutter, I should note, is that space between panels. So uh, that's it. Um, and at this point, I'm going to read our uh, bios. Uh, thank you for <laughs> the applause. Um, OK, so uh, <clears throat> these are not necessarily written in the order of uh, readers, but uh, here are our distinguished panelists. Mark Thomas Gibson's personal lens uh, stems from his multifaceted viewpoint as a Black male, a professor, and an American history buff. Gibson works in drawing, painting, print, and sculpture, and is represented by M plus B in Los Angeles and Loyal in Stockholm. In 2016, Gibson co-curated the traveling exhibition Black Pulp with William Villalongo and has also released two artist books, Some Monsters Loom Large, 2016, and Early Retirement, 2017. His awards include Yado and the Elizabeth Murray Artist Residency, a Pew Fellowship from the Pew Center for, for Arts and Heritage, a Hodder Fellowship from the Lewis Center for the Arts at Princeton University, and a 2022 Guggenheim Fellowship. Gibson has had his most recent solo show, Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood, at M plus B Los Angeles in October 2021, and is an assistant professor at the Tyler School of Art. Uh, Bijak Som is an Indian American trans femme visual artist and author. Inspired by the grammar of comics and graphic novels, Som seeks to expand the vocabulary of the narratives traditionally presented in this medium by exploring such themes as gender, sexuality, memory, and urbanism. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Autostraddle, The Strumpet, Black Warrior Review, and The Brooklyn Rail, amongst other publications. A graphic novel, Apsara Injun, The Feminist Press, is the winner of the 2021 LA Times Books, a book prize for best graphic novel, and a 2021 Lambda Literary Award for uh, winner for best uh, LGBTQ comics. Her graphic memoir, Spellbound, Street Noise Books, was also a 2021 Lambda Literary Award finalist. Although some received a master's degree from Harvard's Graduate School of Design and worked in architecture for I.M. Pei's New York office, among others, she has switched her focus to concentrate on art, comics, illustration, and graphic design. And some also teaches at the School of Visual Arts. Yay. <laughs> um, Emmy and Ringo Award winner, Dean Haskell, shrouds both indie and mainstream comics and is a veteran, a veteran of the comics field having apprenticed as a kid with Bill Sienkiewicz, Walter Simonson, and Howard Chaikin. Um, Haskell created Billy Dogma, the Red Hook, <laughs> illustrated for HBO's Bored to Death, was a master artist at the Atlantic Center for the Arts, is a Yado Fellow, a playwright, a filmmaker, and helped pioneer personal web comics via Activate. Uh, Haskell has written and drawn many comics for Marvel, DC, Image, RG, Archie, IDW, Dark Horse, Heavy Metal, and Webtoon, including The Fox, The Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, X-Men, Deadpool, Batman, Wonder Woman, Godzilla, Mars Attacks, Creepy, SpongeBob SquarePants, and Popeye. Additionally, he has also worked on semi-autobio collaborations with <coughs> legends, uh, Harvey Picard, Jonathan Ames, uh, and Bernard Lopez, Jonathan Lethem, and Stan Lee. <coughs> uh, Emile Ferris is a graphic novelist whose first book, My Favorite Thing is Monsters, has been praised by critics since its publication in 2017. The book, which presents itself as the line notebook diary of a preteen self-avowed werewolf who questions her sexual identity, is set in Chicago in the highly charged political and social climate of the 1960s. Ferris, like her protagonist, uh, Karen Rees, uh, was witness to this highly tumultuous time. Journalists have noted how the book parallels themes of monstrosity and otherness, and since its publication, my, my favorite thing is Monsters has been translated in French, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, German, and Korean, and honored with numerous awards, including the Lambda Literary Award, multiple Eisners, the Ignaz, and the Fauve d'Or, excuse me, <laughs> pardon my French, at the Angoulême Festival in France. The story of its making is heroic and miraculous, if nothing else, but we'll let Emile share this with us. Uh, Ferris has exhibited her art extensively in the US and, and Europe and prior to the pandemic was honored to teach classes at the Louvre in April of 2021. She was shocked and intensely pleased to be named a fellow of the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. So thank you all 
from the bottom of our Leslie hearts for making it. So um, with that, Bishak, do you want to kick us off? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, and thank you to Leslie MFA for, for having me here. Peter, I'm uh, in awe of your mad artistic skills, uh, is all I can say. Um, so I'm just going to share um, some work with you. And it's going to be sort of like a very brief survey of my evolution as a person and an artist. Um, so can everyone see that? All good? OK, so um, I, let's see. Uh, I've been drawing comics since um, I was a wee child. I, I won't share the third grade comics with you, but um, these are some very early works from my from my adolescence, from my probably from when I was seventeen. Um, I don't know how much a like of a sort of through line you can see between this work and the more recent work, but I put it out there for you to decide. Um, it was all very sensitive. I didn't know how to ink, so everything was in pencil. And of course, as you can see, did not reproduce very well, but back then I didn't care because I wanted everything to be sort of ethereal, um, probably to its de detriment. Um, I did not go to school to study art. I went to school to study biology and I failed at that. Um, but I did make a little switch to interior design which involved drawing. So I thought if I could sort of play to my strengths. And these are the kinds of drawings I did back then um, to sort of, you know, uh, take the language of architecture and inter interior design and to kind of, um, I started learning perspective at this point. So I was, you know, working through that, which I think comes in later, as you can see, um, with the later comics work, which also involves a lot of architecture and perspective. But this was my first foray into depicting space um, on the page. Um, at Cornell, where I, where I studied, where I went to undergrad, um, there are a bunch of us who started a comics magazine called Strip, um, including my later high horse uh, stable mates, uh, Andres Arp and Howard Airy. Um, these are some of the comics from that time in college when I learned to ink, um, but with uh, rapidographs, which made things very difficult for me. Um, I didn't realize how much work was involved in doing something like this. Um, I was also experimenting with tone using things like marker. Um, and, um, you know, all I can say is thank God later on in life, I discovered watercolors because it made things much easier for me. But these are the kinds of uh, comics I was doing back then also just just past the threshold of adolescence. Um, after college, I went to grad school for architecture at Harvard, and that was a very different kind of space for me, both uh, emotionally and also like in terms of the kinds of uh, drawings and artistic output I was, I was making. So, you know, there's a lot of three-dimensional work, obviously it's architecture, so I was making a lot of models. But at the time in the 90s, it also involved drawing. So again, sort of, you know, this is why I was interested in it. I thought I could be good at it because I could draw. Um, little did I know what was to come, like, you know, a decade or so later, um, in terms of how representation in architecture changed. Um, so this is the kind of work I was making back then. I was really interested in texture and density and um, a sort of like avant-garde. Uh, the constructivist attitude towards architecture. Um, and yeah, there was a lot of drawing involved. So I thought it was a sort of a natural progression for me. Um, I took a semester at Cambridge where drawing was even more sort of encouraged and involved. Um, and you can see the sort of, maybe you'll see a through line from this kind of work to the later comics work. Um, I did some sort of uh, explorations in collage while I was at Cambridge. Um, exploring the space of domestic architecture and domestic labor. Um, after after uh, grad school, I, I did, I settled into, into the practice of architecture. So I was working at IM Pace office for a while, but I was also making comics. I revived my comics uh, career to some degree, but it was only on weekends and evenings, right? So this, um, these are the kinds of comics I was making then. I'd finally discovered a brush 
So I was inking with a brush, um, but I was also doing uh, tones with Zipatone, which I'm not going to explain, but I'll leave it up to anyone else to explain what Zipatone is to people who do not know what it is. Um, but then I was also starting to experiment with digital tones. So the one on the left is, uh, if you zoom in, you can see the Zipatone effect, but it's done in Photoshop. Um, I had also, as I say, discovered inking with a brush. So I was experimenting a lot with like more extremes in tone within the comics. Um, but at the same time, and I'm, I'm gonna go back and forth between my, my work work, which I've abandoned now, but, um, and my comics work to see if there's any sort of correlation between the two. This is the sort of work I did in the office, right? I did these like um, detailed drawings for architecture uh, for these like you know, public projects. But I would also do 3D modeling, right? So I did like um, 3D models of the projects that we were working on, which then got turned into renderings. I didn't do the renderings. I sent, we sent them off to people to do that. But, you know, these eventually also got turned into real buildings. Um, and yeah, I was helping visualize a lot of things three-dimensionally that a lot of, you know, it would take a lot of work for architects to do um, manually. So I was doing this all on the computer and I really loved that work. And I think it finally, you know, eventually fed into my understanding of space or representations of space in comics. Um, so these are some of the like interior three-dimensional works I, I, I was working on. This is a, a, a townhouse and this is the real space. Um, so I don't know, there's like, it helped for at least the client to visualize what, what they were going to come up with, right? Um, around this time, I was also starting to uh, come to terms with a lot of stuff about myself. Um, it was still a little nebulous, but I was, uh, contributing comics to a bunch of anthologies at the time. This would have been um, late aughts or so. Um, so this is a contribution I made to a book called, uh, an anthology called Beyond, which is a queer um, science fiction uh, anthology. Um, and this particular story I did before I came out as trans, but it's about a bunch of future trans women who uh, sort of create a magical world for themselves. Um, I also did an, um, I contributed a piece to this other book called The Other Side, an anthology of queer paranormal romance comics, which is a mouthful, um, but it also obviously explored a lot of queer themes um, that overlapped with themes of like divinity and, uh, and sort of divine love, right? Um, the, I think a turning point came for me when I did come out as a trans Woman, when um, I was asked to contribute to an all trans comics anthology called We're Still Here, which I think won in Ignatz. I'm ashamed to say I don't remember, but um, uh, I did the cover for it. Um, so there you see the cover. And I also contributed a piece which is about um, a cattle of trans women who go to the beach and have a few revelations along the way. At this point, you can see I'm also like, I'd learned to use watercolors and, ex and it sort of expanded my tonal and um, chromatic palette. And I'm so thankful that I found about, about watercolors because it really changed my life. Um, I was also contributing work to stuff that, to anthologies that were quite large in scale. So these are like broadsheet sized anthologies that I was contributing to. Um, this is a book that was an homage to Little Nemo on uh, Windsor McKay. <clears throat> and then I sort of discovered through watercolors, I discovered painting. So. There's an interesting overlap, I think. I think it's sort of the opposite of Peter's trajectory um, to some degree. You know, I sort of discovered painting through comics and the medium of watercolor. So these are the kinds of things I was working on in between comics. Um, and you can see there's some exploration, again, of architecture, interior space, perspective, um, form, volume, things like this, um, which, I sort of parlayed into my later work as a freelancer when I was asked to join a firm. And uh, I ended up doing these illustrations for a book about architecture. Um, I was illustrating other architects' work um, as part of this series that the book attempted to document. Um, and I had a blast doing this. This is probably my like best job uh, as a freelancer. And it was like sort of tailor-made for me. So I was like super psyched to be able to do that. 
Um, and that work, working on that book, also fed back into my painting, which you can see some, some of which you can see here, which started to expand in dimensions, right? So these are suddenly becoming, instead of like little squares, are now like um, 14 by 20 watercolors that are also exploring themes of architecture, scale, urbanism, um, bodies within architecture, movement, um, things like the sort of kinetics of bodies within space. Um, and finally, in, well, not finally, but in 2020, I had the great fortune to um, have my books come out in the world. I spent, I took a year off from architecture and I quit because I thought that's it for me. I'm done with this toxic work culture. And I started work on a book that you see on the left, Upsara Engine, um, which is, uh, yeah, so I took a year off to work on these short stories, which eventually became collected as that book. I was also working on a second book at the time, which was my graphic memoir called Spellbound, which documented my time as an artist writing Upsara Engine. It also had to do with gender about um, becoming trans and becoming an artist too simultaneously. So these are some of the sort of um, excerpts from that book. Um, there's a substitute character who plays me in the book, which sort of also helped me to come out as trans, um, having this sort of role play element within the book. Um, Apsara Engine came out in 2020 during the pandemic, which was summer, but also, um, you know, went on to, I, I think people, you know, really related to it. Um, so that was a plus. This is the kind of work that's in it, a lot of ink and water, ink and ink wash, uh, monochromatic work that um, sort of investigates ideas about gender, again, um, sexuality, architecture, um, bodies in space, uh, how bodies move through space, and also in like in this panel, um, how the space of architectural representation can um, interact with the space of the comics page, right? Which is something I think Chris Ware investigates a lot. Um, and I was trying to do it in my own way. Um, so these are just some of the other images. Um, speaking of imagined worlds, there's a story in there called Swan Dive, which imagines a trans utopia that is uh, manifested through the art of, through the act of drawing. So I thought that was, um, you know, brought together a lot of threads in my life um, that, became sort of salient to me later, much later in my career than I thought uh, they could do. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of like sort of um, collapsing of architectural representation and comics and uh, ornament within these pages. And there's a, you know, you can see how this like relates back to some of the painting work, which I continue to do during the pandemic, um, exploring similar themes. Uh, spaces of domesticity and interiors and exteriors, ideas about scale, um, and uh, sorry, and uh, again, going back to the space of domestic labor, namely the kitchen, um, revisiting old architectural sort of touchstones like the Bauhaus. This is a Walter Gropius's housing scheme um, that I sort of reimagined with, uh, you know, brown people in it and, and sheep. Um, and finally, I'll tell you just about some of the late, um, more recent projects. This is, this is a piece that appeared in EFLUX magazine, um, curated by Mackenzie Work about trans femme aesthetics. This is um, following up on ideas about trans utopia. And this is a story I did called The Tourist that investigates those very themes. Um, and those are just some of the ideas I'm still investigating uh, as I'm working on my third book. So thank you. Thank you, Bijak. That was amazing. Uh, it's, you know, serendipitously, we just read Mackenzie work in Critical Theory 2 today. Um, so thank you um, very much. Um, so, Emil, would you like to share next? I'm going to unmute. I'm, I'm unmuted. Um, you know, I just should apologize in advance because I'm not quite sure that what I've prepared for you is what you really want. Um, I, and I wanna also say how impressive I found what I just saw. Uh, I would love to spend more time with the work that I just saw, both from you, Peter, and from you, Bishak. Um, it was just 
amazing. I, I was really inspired by it. Both of, of those. I, I have so many things, so many questions for you. And that's not what we're here for. So let me go on. But um, I hopefully I can send you an email maybe and you can answer some questions. <laughs> I'd like that. This is um, just the beginning of a conversation, hopefully. Okay, I, I, if, I, if I hear that, I can feel a little less bad. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm not sure that I have only uh, work. I have a kind of thinking about imagination. It's something that I really like to talk about. And I like to do that primarily because I know how lost I was. Uh, I didn't actually go to school until I was... Uh, Oh gosh, I think I was 40 years old. And, and what happened, um, that I'm not showing you pictures right now, I'm just so I'm showing you a notebook. Uh, what happened was that, um, I'm not sure if it's touched on in my uh, monster talk. My monster talk is gonna be about a lot of things here. Uh, I'm dividing up all the diagrammatic possibilities I can talk about. Uh, this is sort of, you know, I like the naughty bits part uh, a lot. But, um, you know, monsters figures very importantly into my journey into comics, because um, what happened to me is that I sort of came to life uh, one night when um, I saw the Wolfman movie. And I think I was about six years old and uh, it was Creature Features. And I wept copiously after watching him die, which I'm sorry, I spoiled it for you. Um, uh, at the time, I did not know that the man who wrote it, uh, whose name is now ev evading me, was actually, had actually fled the Nazis. And the star that you see in the palm of the next victim was um, uh, symbolic of how much anxiety he felt uh, being a person living in a world where you would be stopped at a checkpoint. And if you had that star, uh, you could be deported suddenly. Uh, you could just disappear or, you know, uh, ultimately, of course, murdered. Um, but uh, the people who made it possible for me to be an artist were my parents who were also artists. And um, this is my father and mother, of course. And uh, I wanted to show you something that I brought here. Uh, my mother uh, made this mask for me when I was six years old. So I got to scare everybody. I've, I've never lost it, I've kept it. And um, so that was her. And uh, they really taught me a lot about imagination. They believed in imagination. And there we are. Uh, I just, um, uh, that's them. I, I talk a lot about the Vesica Pisces. It's something that's very important in my work. And uh, the Vesica Pisces, as you can see, is a, a metaphor for another kind of aperture between worlds, which is also the human aperture between worlds. Um, and uh, sacred geometry is really, really important in my work. If you look into my work, you will find many, many examples of it. Um, here it is, and I find this a really interesting image. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just this vesica, which a saint is speaking. Here it is in Angoulême, which is interesting. It's Jesus passing through. And I think um, one of the things, I, I, this painting will be in future work. But one of the things, turns out it's in the Vatican. <laughs> so, um, I really find, I find a, an awful lot of inspiration in the natural world. Uh, I just was in Milwaukee and I managed to get some bittersweet nightshade, which I, it's just this perfect little plant. It's almost like one of these. And I found out that it prevents you from being cursed. So I'm gonna be uh, wearing that these days. And um, here is one of my characters, Mama. She is passing through a vesica. If you've read my book, then I would be spoiling it if I told you why that is. Mm -hmm. This is me as a little person uh, with my two parents. Anyway, um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we get to something, to a story, because, you know, my personal belief is that stories are literally the, the everything. Story, we learn by stories. Stories are how we understand the world. Stories are how we understand religions or faith. Uh, everything is story. And usually the best way to um, 
find your story is to uh, consider what your unique misfortune is and to really embrace it uh, because that is, I believe, the way to create something of incredible empathy that others will understand. The reason that I wrote this on, um, on this particular kind of paper, I torqued the notebook so intensively is because I was born with severe scoliosis. So I was born with a, a extremely crooked spine and I, I did not walk until I was almost three years old. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm telling you this because um, my misfortune was my gift. And that was that because I couldn't walk, I drew. I had artist parents who set me up a little studio in the living room and said, here you go, you, you can't walk, you know, which is very difficult when you're uh, curious. So what I did instead is I drew everything. I drew everything in the world. And so um, here is the uh, first building in Chicago I lived in. I was uh, actually uh, born in Chicago, but we traveled quite a bit. But this was uh, the high rise building. Now I have my character, Karen, living in the building on the left. But in truth, I lived in what was a, a low income building, which was a wonderful experience because I got to go to the homes of people who, you know, um, sat on the floor and ate off leaves. And um, I got to go to Korean homes and have kimchi. And I got to, I mean, there were, everyone had a open door policy with the children. And so I experienced just the vast uh, diversity of Chicago. And if you see that in my books, it's because it, it was really close to my heart and it incredibly impressed me. And I, I'm just taking a moment here to say how much commonality there is between uh, monsters and artists. I really believe we are of the same ilk. And so I would, if I had more time, I would go into all of that with you. Um, but I think that one of the nicest things is that it's the ability to look into the darkness and see things. We find stories in darkness. That's where you're gonna find, if you're a student listening to me right now, and you think, I just don't know what my story is. Um, you do, you really do. There's a couple of things I really believe. One thing is that if you don't know what you are supposed to do in life, uh, it's generally really useful to think about what you loved doing before anybody told you you couldn't, because that's usually the thing that you are meant to do. Um, and it usually happens before you're four years old. So um, one of my best experiences with art and fine art is really important to me. So this was a painting that hung at the Art Institute of Chicago. And as a child, I was um, really uh, exposed to the mystery and the beauty of art because of this particular painting by Paul Delvaux. And uh, my father brought me to it and he said, now look closely at this painting. And I saw these, uh, these figures and then uh, I looked into the distance and realized what most people are. Most people are living in these houses here with these long skirts on, when in truth, almost all of us are on the beach in our souls. That's who we really are. We are mermaids. And the way that we live without art and without stories and without our passion is we live like these women in these little beach houses. And um, I think if you're in school, you're telling the universe, I want to be on that beach. How do I get there? I think everything you do is really important. Listening to other artists tell you what it was that they did is really important. What I did is I failed at literally everything I did for 40 years until I did the one thing I could possibly succeed at. And, um, and in order to get there, I had to be um, entirely paralyzed from the waist down and lose the ability to draw, uh, which I did. At the age of 40, I was um, very much like uh, one of these women with, uh, the, with the, perhaps the, the fish uh, body, lower body. I was paralyzed from the waist down by a mosquito bite. I spent three weeks in the hospital and then woke up and uh, couldn't speak and, and had other difficulties. And I had been completely wasting my life. I realized at that point that wasting, I don't mean that. I'm, I realized I hadn't done my art. I hadn't been invested and then I couldn't draw. 
So I had to reclaim that ability. And um, one of the things that I really like talking about in, in, uh, in my books is, our, is fine art, uh, because it was through fine art that I found my way back to, um, to what I love. And I developed characters that represented characters in my life. I think it's really important if you want to tell a story that you think about your relationships and think about the relationships that have caused you the most pain. And I would almost always advise you to choose that relationship to write about. It is absolutely the best thing to do. And it is sometimes the only way to figure out, uh, to, to have that catharsis uh, about it. So um, I, this is just some advice uh, for students about different forms of um, how to live in the world imaginatively. Um, and to find what's frightening to you. And it really is important. Monsters are critically important to us. Have I gone over time? Am I, am I, uh, am I talk too long now? I mean, I'm uh, wrapped, I'm entranced. So well, I'll speed up. I'll speed up. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not watching the clock at this moment. You're great. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to tell you this painting is in Detroit. If you can see it, please do. It's, yeah. it's fantastic that we have it. Usually I, that's me. <laughs> that's me as Karen. Uh, it's just a little kid. Um, but one of the most wonderful things that happened to me is that I found out that women could be writers. And I'm old enough that, of course, that wasn't something uh, that was talked about an awful lot. But I found that out through uh, Bride of Frankenstein, because this wonderful actress uh, portrays um, Mary Shelley in the beginning. And then, of course, later on, she's this incredibly fabulous, gorgeous monster, uh, which, you know, that's me um, uh, mm. at, uh, at about uh, 13 years old. And uh, I was very invested in uh, non-traditional uh, attire, which was very questionable uh, during the 70s. <laughs> um, and I have, I, I'm happy to share this with your students. Uh, this is a list of ways to develop characters. These are all things that you can do and ask yourself about your characters when you're in the development stage. And one of my favorite things about them, since we're all adults here, is, um, well, I would have talked about masturbation, but I won't do that. Instead, because we're, we're running out of time. What I will talk about is the one thing uh, that I think is really important to talk about, and that is, what will I potentially never get in my life? Because I feel, or I am convinced, I don't deserve it. I can't have it. That's one of the most important things to ask when you're developing a character. What is it they feel they can't have? This is more about imagination, and I'm happy to uh, share some of this because we're running out of time, and I think I've gone. No, we're, we're, we keep going for uh, Emma, Emil. We're not. We're we're good on the time. Don't. Okay. All don't, right. Um, you know, I really believe that you should allow your imaginative expectation to rise as high as you possibly can when you're writing, um, and that is, I really believe you should try to live as much as possible inside your world. I have this exercise I love to share with people when you're developing a graphic novel. I find personally, it is really, really helpful to go to a thrift shop when you're blocked and just to go and pick up anything that you find attractive or engaging, something you'd wanna draw or photograph and ask yourself who, which one of your characters owns this thing and why? Because doing that will open you up to the character's life and all of their stories. And I really, I feel that that is an, a great exercise and you will also end up on hoarders, which <laughs> I can say that I might actually have to do that. Um, anyway, um, this is a lot more about this. And I'm happy to pass these along to your students if you would ever want me to. Um, yes. But once again, it's talking to you. It's talking to you. The last thing here is people who have scarred you and people who have cost you something dear are priceless to you as a writer. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really do believe in that. Um, and this is me and my little daughter who uh, I uh, had. And um, this is just before about, this is about uh, six years before I was paralyzed by her, uh, by her, not by, by West Nile virus and had her. And this is about the bite that I received. Um, this was featured in the Chicago Magazine. And it talked about the night, my 40th birthday, 
when I was bitten, my daughter very intelligently told me she had a premonition, don't go to the party, uh, the party that I was bitten, uh, and it was a bad idea. She said, my experience of the angel of death was uh, that it was a filing cabinet. I, I just saw this um, 1940s metal filing cabinet that set, asked me whether I was going to stay alive or not, and then I decided to. Um, but it was a it was a fairly painful experience. These are the people that really helped me. My daughter is in the foreground there. She's absolutely, you know, she's beautiful and amazing. This is the drawing we did together uh, when I was uh, when I was um, recovering. I couldn't hold a pen anymore, and so she uh, she duct taped a, a quill pen to my hand, and uh, I had to move my whole arm to draw. It took a long time to do it. Uh, but I got it done and it was pretty, there was a lot of uh, prescience in it because she drew me standing up out of the wheelchair. You can see that here, um, which I think is pretty, uh, pretty great. This is the, the process of me doing the book. And I did a lot of uh, desperate things. Uh, I stole bank coffee. That's me stealing coffee from the bank by the, by the, by the pot, by the tin pot. Um, and this is the book that came out of it. It took many years to write. Um, so uh, if you haven't read it, uh, that's, that's cool. Uh, but if you would like to, that would be wonderful. Um, this is a seminal moment. It was at this time, around this time that I also met my uh, friend there, Dean, uh, but uh, uh, I met Art Spiegelman and he was uh, very kind to me. Uh, I was in the middle of stealing appetizers. <laughs> By, uh, this is me at the Louvre. I had just a, a moment in, at this time when I realized that as a kid who looked at art books and never could possibly imagine themselves ending up uh, there uh, leading groups of people and talking to children and adults about art, um, for me to have made that uh, enormous uh, uh, circuit from uh, pretty uh, extreme poverty and, and difficulty and, and disability to this moment, I will say the one thing I learned, and it is the thing I would most want to convey to people who are um, in school, maybe younger, or trying to figure themselves out, uh, no matter what, don't give up. Don't give up. It can be very different. It can be very different in six months. Just hold on and keep, keep asking yourself the right questions and believing that you can find the right answers for yourself. They won't be anybody else's answers. They're just for you. And, you know, I really believe uh, human beings, every single one of us was, was, we chose to come here with something strong and important to give to the world. Every one of us has that, every single one of us. So I, um, I'm just gonna end it here with me at the Louvre being a big giant show off. Um, and uh, it was a very, it was a fun, and this was a great painting because if there's not a painting that's more comics than this painting, I don't know. First of all, you've got Jesus pew pewing a giant beam of something at St. Francis. That's the most awesome superhero moment in the Louvre. And then you've got all of the bad things that later happened to St. Francis, which is fantastic. It's all great. Um, and here I am again, holding forth. It was so fun. It was so incredibly fun. So um, this is a great painting and I completely forget the name of the painter, but, uh, and I should be ashamed of myself. Fantastic monster and more good stuff in the world of monsters. And then me drawing myself as that monster, which was, you know, very good. I'm sure I was a monster in a past life. Isn't that obvious? <laughs> Anyway, um, well, I think I've reached my Monsters in the Louvre uh, stuff. Here's, here's a page, a couple pages from forthcoming material uh, that uh, reference some great paintings. This painting is not in the Louvre, but it's, it's a fantastic one. And this is how I really wish the monster human dynamic would end up. Uh, it, it, it's too often that the monster is killed by the hero, but I don't think it's heroic to kill monsters. I think it's heroic to love them as much as you possibly can. And here we have that happening. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna speed through and I'm coming to my, you know, it's uh, incumbent upon us to sew our heads back on, to sew our heads back on. 
as artists, we, we are really damaged by our society. You've probably been told a lot of stupid things about how you can't do something, you know, whatever. Uh, so your head back on, you know, so your head back on, get back on it. It's important. There we are. <laughs> I kind of like that. And uh, you don't need to know any of this stuff. This is just this is just me holding forth about things, but uh, I think we have certain dangers in our life, uh, the danger of hate, and, and it's sort of rearing its ugly head. There are a lot of folks out there that want us to slide back into the 1950s, and we, we absolutely have to continue to love them, but uh, not agree with anything that they, they're trying to get us to do. It's, it's all wrong. They'll eventually realize how wrong they are. And then that's me saying thanks. And uh, thanks, thank you. Um, from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> uh, anyway, there we are. I'm, I know I've gone over. I apologize to the people who will follow me. I think I don't. I hope no. I don't cut into anyone's time. Anyway, no, no need to apologize. Thank you so much, Emil. That was uh, really, really inspiring. And um, yeah, I mean, if if only we had a, a week to <laughs> to delve into this. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, thank you. I, by the way, I got texts from my my um, partner who was is listening to you and crying in the other room. So you're making <laughs> an enormous impact. Um, so thank you. So Mark, do you want to take yeah, it key, up? <laughs> Give me a second. Well, I just want to say thank you to everyone and thank you, Peter, for asking me to be here today. Um, this is incredible. I uh, did not expect this on my uh sunday night that i'd be sitting here with all these amazing people having such an interesting conversation a powerful conversation i think that needs to be had um all right let's show the top wait actually long talk boom crush that one all right let's show to the top so where's my view okay so i'm mark thomas gibson Born in Miami, Florida in 1980. Um, I guess the best way I can kind of give this talk in relationship to how I ended up kind of making a comic is that for a long time, um, I didn't really realize like what I was supposed to be doing with my art. I felt like for a, like I was supposed to be a painter and I was supposed to be like an artist with a capital A and whatever the hell that meant. Um, a lot of that came from the fact that I started art school like in fifth grade. I went to an art elementary school, middle school, high school, college, and grad school. So I, I can't do nothing else but like wrap paintings and make paintings. So I like growing up, growing up, like starting off that early, there was a definite idea of what it was to be an artist. And it was not to delve into comics and it was not to delve into cartooning. And it was not to delve into anything that I actually was immediately in love with in early age. I too, I had braces on my legs to the age of three. Um, so my feet were turned around the other way. So I spent a lot of time drawing. Um, so it took me a while to kind of realize what I needed to do. And when I was in grad school was when it started kind of coming into mind. And uh, the dean at the time at Yale, his name was uh, Robert Storr. He kept, he pushed us on this idea and he said it one time and he said it another time in another speech, but it really kind of landed in my ear. It was like, you need to have skin in the game. You can't just simply sit on the sidelines and kind of like just critique everything and or just make work that kind of is living in one world and like while well, you live in another, like you have to figure out how you actually are involved in the space. So way I kind of did that was curating a show called Black Pulp with me and William Villalonga in 2016. And basically the work of the show was to kind of take contemporary black artists and take um, artists of the 20th century and look at them in the context of print media. And for me, I kind of handled like the comic side of it. And while doing so, I kind of learned so much more about it. I kind of became obsessed, but then I realized I like, also became, became obsessed around the wrong things. Like I kind of became obsessed about like, who was the first person to do a black superhero? Who was the first person to do, you know, this idea of milestones and this idea of like a linear lineage of way information operates rather than thinking about like the, the group and the society that was actually generating this work. One thing that did kind of come to mind when I was doing it was starting to think about this idea of um, an arms race and this kind of visual like arms race that was taking place for a lot of black artists during that period of time, trying to figure out how do we actually tell stories around black bodies and have black characterization without it being uh, derogatory. Like that was something I found very interesting. So I got to meet a lot of amazing people while doing this exhibition. Things like all people like Oliver Harrington came into focus for me, um, Dark Laughter. 
series um, and many other the works he did, the idea that his work actually had the satire and this political edge to it was something that was the first time I had actually seen somebody speak in talk in a way that I, I felt wasn't, um, wasn't satirical in the way that the Sunday comics that I grew up with in the 80s were, where it was like a little bit of a nod and a little bit of like a, a pinch at something that was happening in the world, but a real like, no, this is wrong. This is weird. This is class. This is race. This is national politics. This is global politics. Like willing to go there. Um, George Harriman, another individual um, that we came into the exhibition, this idea of, of passing kind of was also um, brought up in the conversation, the idea of racial identification and characterization. Um, was something else that we kind of got to touch on a bit. Uh, Jackie Orms, another amazing artist um, who's probably going to, I think is coming more into focus now for people. Um, Billy Graham, I got to actually see this print, this drawing in person and it was incredible. And uh, to somebody else like that I wasn't raised with. And that was the thing is that a lot of the time when I was young and a lot of you who are out there, the students, you may not understand that you actually do have a lineage that you might be making and generating information and visual information and that no one else can really speak to. And it doesn't mean that you're wrong. It just means that maybe the space that you're in, they maybe the people just don't know. And it isn't like they're bad people because they don't know. It's just that they don't know. But it took me to go to grad school for me to see like, oh, Daumier is my lineage. And oh, like, you know, um, you know, <laughs> Crum and like Spiegelman, like these are my lineage. You know, it's not just because somebody who looks exactly like me doesn't mean that they're the person I'm supposed to be looking at. So my first book was called Some Monsters Loom Large um, back in 2014. I was able to do it with a grant from the FCA. Uh, crazy thing. So I'm making uh, the show, doing Black Pulp. It's traveling different places. Um, and then at the time I'm working for the artist Kara Walker and Kara says to me, we're one morning talking about Leila Ali and this book that she made for MoMA. And she says to me like, well, you should make a comic book. And I was like, well, you should make a comic book. And I mean, I tell the story because it's exactly how weird it was. And then she was like, well, you should make a comic book. And I was like, and then I said, I should probably listen to her. She's Kara Walker. You know, like working next to someone and working next to other artists, mentors, let's say, like you sometimes are in someone else's space and you don't, and you think you're going to be in that space to learn something, but you can't really learn something if you don't actually open up your ears. And so when they were going to give you something, you have to be able to be open to accepting the gift. And then you have to actually try to do something with the gift. And so then I said to her, well, I actually don't know how to do sequential art. And she's like, well, you make one drawing and make another. And I was like, okay, great, genius. So I started off with like nothing. And then by the end I had, you know, these characters and it was just simply like following what I say to my students a lot is just fall forward. You know, like if you're going to fail, fail forward, you know, like just take, you'll take some ground every time you do it. Now for me, my relationship with werewolves, well, it started with like Michael Jackson and Thriller in the opening scene. My sister, who well, at the time I was a super Michael Jackson fan and she was like, come downstairs. I want to show you something, you know? And then, uh, you know, Michael Jackson wolfs out. And it was like the first time he was supposed to actually come to Miami. It was the only time he ever performed in Miami. It was like, like 85. And I had tickets to go see him. And the whole time I was terrified. But I've always was fascinated by werewolves. The, the change, the shift, the seen and the unseen. And another element of why I was interested in werewolves um, and how it kind of played out and became more, I don't know, clear for me. Because I feel that my body in this space, in this world, in this culture, often I'm seen as one thing and I'm not. And something I have to kind of remind people or tell people, like when I walk down the street, people don't smile at me. Like people don't like, people avert their eyes when they see me. And that's not how I think I carry myself, but it's how I'm perceived in this world. So this interior self, the person I actually am, I always as, as aware that I have a shell, um, a suit almost. So this is the first drawing. I sat up that night, I went home and I sat down and I drew this. And then I started thinking about this character just kind of being slightly depressive and just like kind of automatic drawing and then kind of like showing you his inside. So he's like digging a watery grave and he's like doing all these things. And he's on this little island, uh, which is kind of limbo, also a representation of where I grew up, which was Miami and when I was a kid. And he, this giant like demon mountain thing pops out of the water, he swims out to it. He climbs inside of it. Then we go inside of him and inside of him is this little earworm. And the earworm has its own quest, which is to like kill the main character because the little earworm is actually aware of the cyclical nature of the violence that's about to occur in the rest of the storyline. 
And so we kind of jump back to him. He's inside of the mount, the demon mountain. And then a story starts being presented to him, which is like the beginning of America. And this moment in which the first settlers, the first pilgrims that came to America, they came too late. And they basically ended up having to eat like, well, Native Americans. Well, they were eating hats, they were eating shoes, they ate their own feces. And then they actually dug up like a Native American burial ground and they consumed a body. And so this idea of eating, this idea of like consumption, this idea of like what I consider the manifest destiny monster is like born. And this person is tainted by that. And through that act, then he taints others and transforms other bodies. And then we get into like westward expansion and, and uh, yeah, so then he's pulled out of that and then he's drawn and he kind of wakes up again. And so the narrative is basically like either like slightly escapes his death and then wakes up in another environment. And this time he's in the Alamo, which had a lot to do for me about like American victimhood and the idea of like when we've done things. And if you actually look into the history of how those things actually kind of take place, we have a really particular hand inside of those things. And then we retell the story as if, you know, you know, remember the Alamo, but what do we actually remember about the Alamo? So in this part of the storyline, he ends up meeting this other character who's kind of like him, this little weird like brown ball character turns to the, and the ball character is kind of representation of like Huckleberry Finn and, and the other uh, werewolf is like this kind of nigger Jim kind of character. And then it turns out like they basically are like have flipped on him and then they kill him and then he wakes up again. Um, that goes on and on and on until basically the end of the story, we get to like the end of the world, the four horsemen come down. Uh, we don't resolve our issues in time and, you know, Armageddon. Uh, the second book I made, uh, Early Retirement, the edition Patrick Fry. Uh, the question for me at the time was thinking about utopia. And, and it was like 2015 is when I started making the book. And I was starting to think about like, you know, with the politics of the time and things that were happening, which is like, why, why is it utopia on the table? <laughs> looking back at that now it's not so crazy man. but it's like that was the thought that I had you know why isn't that even a discourse and I couldn't understand it and so usually what happens is that I have a premise and then I have to figure it out so I start generating the work and I start making the drawings and they start to produce itself and so in the story we kind of cut back to that werewolf character and at the end of the last story he kind of becomes like a street prophet I've always been interested in people who wear like foil hats and people who like feel like they've been in contact with something greater than themselves. And then they have the need and the desire to then prophesize or be prophetic to others and tell them about that, that experience. Um, even though sometimes it's a shared interior experience that we all maybe feel. So he ends up, you know, and he's at the bar, he gets fired from actually being um, a street prophet and he ends up at a bar and it happens to be the night of the election. And, um, I drew this image before the election actually occurred. And then I decided not to actually put the winner's name inside of it. Originally I had the name of Trump inside of it, but then I took it out when I went to like printing it. I, have a, I believe in like the power of duplication and stuff like that. Um, so he, uh, he's, everyone's mournful. He goes outside, he yells at God, gets cracked on the head with ball lightning. As I'm doing, talking to you right now, my dog is bawling up in my lap. I'm kind of, uh, <laughs> so, um, he's cracked in by ball of lightning. He falls into another dimension. There he sees this thing called the truth. And he comes back as a prophet to offer the truth to other people. Um, the book kind of goes into this whole other thing where there's like multiple stories. There's an angel that's behind everything, but he's kind of having a, a schizophrenic episode and he's kind of like, you know, didn't even realize what he did. And, you know, everything just kind of falls apart at the end and it ends with like basically Trump um, and a bunch of other protesters and the naysayers all kind of coming together and having this giant brawl in New York City. And then a giant tidal wave comes because like mother nature just kind of wipes them all out. And then the two main characters to the angel and the prophet sit down and actually have a conversation and realize that they actually, that this symbol that they see throughout the storyline, the zigzag pattern is actually a representation of like this, which is like two hands meeting each other. And this idea of like depend dependency and that we have this thing inside of us where we need other people, but yet we have to kind of deal with the conflict of that desire and that necessary nature between these two things. That's actually kind of the work. And that, you know, so they realize they need to actually walk together and talk together. So the pandemic hits um, and I like just start generating this work in the mornings as things are current going on. I'm thinking about like images of black death, idea of dance, death dancing into town, um, imagery like that. 
And these are just these things I needed to do in the morning. And I hadn't really made work like this before. Um, but it was just like, I was waking up every day and there would be a new level of something where I'd be like, what the fuck? Um, and, and then when he made this, I was just, you know, when I made this, because he said these things about putting bleach in, on, in your body and light and shit. And then I was like, and he could still win the election and all this other stuff. I just had to kind of go there and make this work. And this wasn't something I had never had really, it's something I would do as a doodle on the side, but it was something I would never would show anyone. But since we were all were kind of like locked away from each other, it was like a way to kind of just show people and think about it and kind of have a comment on it. I just needed it. Um, this is uh, the removal of Rizzo statue. Um, I'm from, I'm living in Philadelphia right now. And Mayor Rizzo was a very crazy, um, punitive, evil kind of uh, police chief. And um, Mayor, like, if you, I mean, he did a bunch of crazy stuff. Um, but yes, not a great guy. Continuing on, uh, yeah, my work then started kind of taking into this more like daily making work that was dealing with American politics and satire. George Floyd dies. Um, started thinking, <laughs> then all of a sudden, you know, I was talking to a friend and I said to him, like, you know, my, my Saturn eating his son is like the version I like is the Rubens version, like, not really that Goya version that much. And my friend was like, really? And he was like, I've never seen that one. I'm like, how could you never see that? Like, the moment when he's like biting the chest of the child, it's like insane. It's like so dark. It's a whole nother level. Um, and then as I was talking to my friend about it, it just, this just popped into my head and then I had to like render it and make it happen. So my thing is sometimes like, or I make one-to-one -one imagery, then sometimes, yeah, it's like the strip sometimes occurs or the strip occurs when I bring the work together and you see things in kind of a sequential order in that form, or it gets compiled and finds itself back in the book. Um, another thing that happened was that I was generating all these images and it was a little bit like I was trying to be like the New Yorker, uh, one man New Yorker. And I was like, well, I can't tell everything I need to tell because there's so many things that are happening. And so this idea, this character called the, the town crier came up. And so he just sort of like yells everything and he's just like glitting it out. And so this is like the second town crier I believe I made. And then that night I was so excited because I think I made, no, maybe this is the third one. I think I made yeah, I was just making them and I went to bed and then the next before I finished making it and then like the Haitian president was murdered, was assassinated. And so then I added that to the thing and then all of a sudden the global desk occurs and then all of a sudden now we have expansion, you know, just kind of call and response is a large part of what I think about when I'm making the work. Um, because I, it's always been that way for me. Um, and I think that's something that you, you know, as an artist, you have to kind of listen to yourself and you have to kind of, the stories are kind of there, but I've always used to have this thing where I would fight my stories. I would push against my stories. I would say my stories are not enough. My stories are, are like, who would want to, who, who does care, you know? But since I was generating it, and so then I had to like step outside of it. And then I, there was a moment that kind of happened and I don't have this in this talk, uh, where Eric Garner's like murders got off. And I was living in New York City at the time. And I did this night of drawing like 40 drawings in a night. And I just had this fuck it moment. And where I was just like, my life as I exist in this body in this world is forfeit in many ways on a day to day basis, like crazy stuff can happen. Like actually, I just had a neighbor who had his grandson just was killed like two blocks away, she got shot. So things can happen. So at some point, you just have to say like, Am I going to bet on me? I got to do it. And I just started doing it. And that little thing, I have to remind myself sometimes when I'm like edging, when I'm just like hedging my bets and saying, oh, well, maybe, oh, that's a little bit too much. Or, oh, I shouldn't say that. Or da, da, da. It's like one life to live, right? So this is kind of a part of the process too. I was like, I usually generate a lot of drawings. I try to draw every day. And so sometimes they're built out of collages that then become paintings. And then I started having this whole vibe about like, well, everything that happened in 2020, then like, like what if time could be the gutter space, right? So if I'm making these objects and I'm making all these things occur, maybe in some point in time, these things can kind of remerge. Um, when you make artwork in my way of making it, a lot often it's like, I'll have a series of, of, of drawings I'll show on a show, right? And I think about the body being like, I don't know, the page flip and the body's moving through the page flip, the walls of the gutter, right? But then at some point, someone buys this one or that one goes there and that one goes there. And all of a sudden they're broken apart. 
And then maybe sometime they'll come back together. Or maybe if you look back at my work, you'll start to understand like, oh, he's talking about the last painting. He's talking about this painting from three years ago. And what has happened between those two spaces, that's what's actually kind of important to understand. So then I started doing this thing with like a, like a uh, momentum to damnatio, this kind of removing of information and started taking things out of the work, thinking about how we're gonna forget everything that happened. We're gonna forget the protests with millions of people on the streets. How can you forget it? But yet we will forget it. And we will be stuck in the same part and we will have to have the same arguments again, hopefully with more people who have more enlightened th thoughts. Maybe some of the books they read that summer will have some lasting power. So, and then in this place, I started putting these flowers and that was kind of a bit of a cynicism, but it was because I knew that, because I, I saw that we were living in this weird moment that we're like still life usually starts to reappear again. And where ideas around like beauty starts to like, what about beauty? What about leisure? What about man? Eh? And I was just like, I don't have feeling it, but how about I, I use it and I call it out. And then some people get it. Some people walk through the show and they understand what I'm saying. It's, and like this magic trick that's kind of occurs. And that gutter space thing that always made me think about that magic trick, the before and the after and how we're so susceptible to that, how we can read into that so quickly. Another thing I do thinking about sequentiality is that I, I had this thing, I, I was, well, I've never seen a dead Klansman and I was very curious about the idea of a dead Klansman and people actually owning those idea, that visual idea. Um, things I like about comic books, I like the idea that it's haptic, I like the idea that it sits in your hand, I like the idea that it's in your world, it's in your life. So when I make a print or I make and generate imagery, I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about how is it set in someone's life. So I, I started thinking, okay, fine. Everyone should have one on their wall. You should have a dead Klansman on your wall. Like if that's what you really believe, if you're truly the anti that space, then like, why not allow it to live in your life? Why not? I mean, maybe you'll put it in your bathroom. Maybe you'll put it in your bedroom. Maybe you'll put it somewhere in the basement, but why not? So I started generating them litho, other forms. Uh, silk screen. Uh, I last show I made it as a free poster, so everyone can just take one. No, no reason why not to have it in your life. And then the idea is that then you have to confront why is it that I don't have it in my life? Why won't I pick it up? Why will I? Not? You know, things like that. I think about a lot. Make it as a sculpture. Why not have it in your life? Make it in multiples. The multiple typically, when you're talking about in the case of fine art, usually is seen as a negative. And I think that's something to do definitely with an American culture more so than other cultures. But like this idea of it being devalued, and then also how that leads into like the idea of comics being a devalued thing, maybe possibly because of its like, you know, multiple nature. So as the show, I presented like this work in a series where basically we have this Klansman who's defending uh, Grant's statue. Uh, and center is like a, an etching that I've made that's reproduced several times throughout it. Um, and each one is like representation. The first one is the prize. The second one's called the savior. The third is the discussion, the fall, the improvement, the monument, the spread, the hope. Um, and currently I'm building it again as a, an actual like larger scale statue that with the dancing flower. Um, and the show actually kind of became this whole thing about whiteness. And I didn't really want to make a show about whiteness, but it kind of became that. And I think it's like, I was very curious to see how people either rejected it. And some people walked in the room and were standing there thinking about it. Other people like would leave the space. I get to see, I get to see people digest what I offer them a lot. And, and that's a big part of it because communication was something I struggled with my entire art life. And trying to do it the way other people told me I was supposed to do it never gave me what I wanted. And then when I started doing it the way I wanted to do it, all of a sudden I started having the conversations I wanted to have. And I started being in the groups of people that I want to be with who actually seem to care about the same things I care about and who actually have a lot of the same feelings and emotions that I have. And so you're not alone all of a sudden. That's one thing I think about comics that always kind of gave me something. Other day I was hanging out with some neighbors, first time hanging out with this group of people. All of a sudden this one guy said something about, um, Tim Sal dying. And uh, it was a moment where I said, yeah, man. And then it was like, boom, never knew this guy. We just start going down the roster of our last 40 years of loves together. You know, it's a beautiful thing. Last thing I want to show you is Biden's entry into Washington. It's, um, it's a kind of taken from James Enzer's Christ entry into Brussels. And this idea of like the moment of like the moment that we're in sometimes how things are actually occurring and then the other shit's occurring too. And, and it's just like, what is actually the focus point, you know? What's the distraction? 
what's there, you know, what can we do with the time? Um, so I think in the closing, one thing I think about what I try to do in my work is to try to present like, let's try to present some ideas around like <laughs> good trouble. Um, John Lewis, who had a pleasure, the pleasure of meeting at one point in my life, you know, talked about that. And the idea that what you can do with your time and your energy as an artist is you can actually like bring yourself to it. And he sold this story. Uh, we'll have him, his coffin there in the back with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, because I do think about the ideas around community and solidarity and different cultures and different types of people and certain shared histories and how important that actually is to know what those histories are and how we actually identify with each other. But he said this one quick story and I'll tell you that in a mouth. He said, he said, to, like, he said, he said, comic books changed my life. I was a kid growing up on a small farm. I get this com comic book about the Montgomery bus boycott. It's like, it's edited by Martin Luther King Jr. He's like, I'm reading this thing. And all of a sudden I started to think about that. Martin, Martin Luther King Jr., all the things that he was doing, he's sitting there at a coffee table and like editing a comic book. Because he understood that the visual and the language, those two things married together that that could actually tell people, bring this other abstraction, those reality and abstraction back into a space that where he can go into people and they can understand it. So he, from that, he ends up writing a letter to Martin Luther King Jr. and saying, hey, this was an incredible thing. He's like, like 13, 14 year old guy. He gets a bus ticket from Martin Luther King Jr. to come meet him. And that's how he joined the movement. And so then he says, so don't tell me comic books have no power. You know what I mean? That's it. It's like you put the energy out, you will receive it back. It's an incredible art form. So with that in closing, thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Wonderful. Um, okay, Dean. So would you like me to share a screen and then you can um, advance me? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so and thanks for me... inviting me, Peter and, and yeah, Leslie and, and all the other participants is pretty incredible. I, I feel like I should go through this quickly because I'm sure people uh, are getting it, it's getting long, right? You think, or or can I? Uh, well, I mean, let's let's see how we do. Uh, All right. So I don't want to, you well, know, I, I, I don't want to curtail anyone. Uh, okay. But here, here is your. Um, and you can make that bigger you can somehow, it, right? Can, can everyone see it? Can y'all see it? Okay, so. Okay. I, I struggled with my presentation because um, I was trying to figure out what Peter exactly wanted for this. And we went through a couple of different iterations. And the first three slides are just going to be basically some covers of just to give a sense of the different kind of work I've done. I've hopscotched between superhero, memoir. Uh, you know, I've run the gamut from working for franchise publishers like Marvel and DC and self-publishing and working with a lot of independent um, publishers. Um, I turned 55 two weeks ago uh, at the Manhattan Film Institute, uh, learning how to make films because I'm always uh, learning. I love storytelling. I love the power of story. I think we've all discussed that idea that it's not just, your, in, when I draw, I'm trying to draw a story. I'm not illustrating. I'm trying to figure out how is it a story and or how do you earn the next panel and get to the next part of, of a page, you know? Um, so at age 12, I became otherwise unemployable when I fell in love with comics and decided that's what I was gonna dedicate my life to. And later on, Howard Chaikin would say that that's a calling when you are committed to something like that, you know, through thick and thin, no matter what, and the sacrifices and the things you forfeit to do the art form that nobody is asking you to do, right? You do it because you have to, um, to the chagrin of friends and family sometimes, you know, and or the support of. Um, I remember picking up my first comics. Well, probably I was given my first comics from my mom, like copies of Shazam or whatever. And then I discovered the newsstand uh, back when we had newsstands and that's where you would get comic books. And um, uh, believe it or not, when I was a kid, comics were not cool. Uh, you were made fun of for reading comics, for liking comics. Uh, there was no comics academia, no comics college, not, not when I was a kid. So you had to learn trial by fire, by doing comics. That's how you made comics, again, for better or for worse. Uh, and at age 12, I dedicated my life. By age 17, going on 18, um, I was at uh, um, 
music and art turned into LaGuardia High School in my senior year. And I became the assistant to Bill Sienkiewicz, uh, who was working on New Mutants and Electra Assassin in 1985. I also worked with Howard Chaikin on American Flag and with Walt Simonson on his Thor run. And that was, that was comic school for me. Just being able to work on those backgrounds or erase pages or whatever the hell I had to do. Uh, I learned so much more about comics and I was going to an art school that again, kind of, you know, downplayed the idea of comics. Although later on in life, you find out that's everybody's secret desires to make comics, which is weird, <laughs> you know, like anyway. Uh, having said that, uh, I did work a lot uh, for, eventually I got to work for uh, Marvel, DC. I, uh, two weeks ago, I had an Archie comic come out, uh, The Fox, uh, well, whatever, we're looking at Peter's screen right now. And um, Peter, there's one more slide, I believe, that you can, or go to the next one. Is it, are you there? There you go. Uh, yeah. I, worked with, uh, I worked with Harvey Picar on American Splendor, and, and I drew his origin story, The Quitter. I worked with Jonathan Ames on a, a graphic novel called The Alcoholic. I worked with Inverna Lopez on her story about being in Cuba and escaping Cuba as an artist. Uh, I got to work with Jonathan Ames on the HBO TV show, Bored to Death, where I drew uh, the Zach Galifianakis character, who was a cartoonist loosely based on me, uh, and I drew all the artwork that he did. Uh, and then, I, but I was also, I discovered live journal on the internet, the blogging platform, where I realized a lot of my artist friends were like, you know, every day, that's what was, that was our virtual studio mates. If you're working from home, that's who you would log on to and say hi to when you weren't talking to them on the phone. And what was cool about the internet and live journal was that you could share artwork to each other or little sneak peeks. And it occurred to me that I knew enough artists that why don't we try to do like a little web comics collective? And in 2005, at the end of 2005, I recruited about seven other artists and we started something called Activate, which was a, a web comics hub. And that's where I did a bunch of my Billy Dogma comics that was basically an avatar that I created because I realized I was just drawing other people's stories. I was drawing other companies' characters and I wanted to kind of start to, you know, deep dive more into uh, what I might write and draw on my own. And I didn't have the confidence to be a writer. But after a while, I realized that as an artist, you are a writer. You are a co-author with the writer because image is text in comics, especially in comics. I know it's true in cinema and other visual storytelling mediums, but image is text. You are drawing. There's you, the four artists that are here right now. You give us the same script. We're going to draw something different. And they're all probably going to be right. You know, it's just different points of views. And that's also the power of comics. And what's great about comics is that it's literally a blank piece of paper or these days a blank digital space, you know, um, where, you know, you exploit uh, the narrative real estate of, of the blank page, you know, and that's what the next section of artwork, I think, Peter, if you could show after this, again, just more examples of comics I've worked on. And this was Activate where uh, we, we turned the, the live journal uh, version into its actual own website and, until I think it ended in 2010 or 11, maybe 12, I don't remember. Uh, but there was over 50 artists on the website toward the end that were creating comics for free, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so if you go to the next section, Peter. Oh, I also Here. did a comic called Street Code. Uh, when uh, DC Comics started a web comics initiative called Zuda, and I pitched them three ideas. They asked me to pitch some ideas. I, I pitched like two superhero and one memoir and they went with the memoir. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I started telling my own stories even though I was drawing other people's lives. I started to draw my own life, mm -hmm. you know which is a very vulnerable thing to do as, as we all know. Um, this section, and then I'm gonna end by reading a short story. Uh, this section is just examples of me playing with the narrative, the, the narrative landscape. Like, you know, sometimes there's cinematic qualities, right? On the left side, there's this page where there's this flower that kind of grows and then starts to wilt. And it also juxtaposes with a relationship kind of forming and then ending uh, all in one page. Uh, this next part actually comes with words, but uh, 
I just wanted to show how the power of how you can stagger these panels and show like this little, you know, visual journey um, through image. Dean, you should tell me to advance because otherwise I'm just doing I'm sorry. it like, I'm sorry. On, on instinct, you know? This is a, a, a story that Jonathan Lethem or Lethem wrote. And the left side, I just wanted to show that he had so much detail in his script. It wasn't really a comic script. It was more of a, an essay uh, that I tried to figure out on the, well, you can see on the left side, this split between two aspects of, an, uh, of a street and an alleyway where he talks about all these different parts of this walk he would take to his studio called Back on Nervous Street. And it was actually Nevin Street in Brooklyn. And then I added in the text, which you can see here is an abundance of text. But if you follow, if you, if you were able to read it, you would actually see that there are these little kind of checkpoints that when you end a paragraph, it will actually show kind of an aspect of what he's talking about in his narrative. Next. Oh, <laughs> what was it? Barclays Center uh, was hosting the weekend <laughs> for some concert and they wanted to give him a gift. So they reached out to me. I don't know why. I think it was his Starboy album. And uh, they're like, Dean, come up with a comic, please, something. And I came up with this idea. Well, he's called Starboy. Uh, why don't I have like this, this version of him like floating in this nebulous space uh, with this universe, you know, inside him. And then he, he identifies, you know, the nine planets uh, and, or is it the eight planets? I think it, it's eight because I think Pluto's not a planet now or something. Anyway. Um, and he puts them on like rings and then like he explodes and like gives birth, you know, like a big bang type thing. And, and then he uh, lets go of everything that was inside him. It was just this weird idea, having fun. And that was gifted to him. This like big poster size uh, of this piece. Next. These are pages, uh, four pages, including a spread of some work I did on the Fox. And, you know, traditionally, you know, the default in doing comics is to draw square panels next to each other. And you get, you know, from one to five or six panels in, in most traditional comics. Uh, and I, I was trying to blow that open. Like, how do, you, how do you make the space work? Now, these don't have the lettering or the words in them right here. But just trying to, like, play with the idea of moving around the page. And it's something I, I kind of learned from Will Eisner. Uh, Will Eisner played, played with uh, layouts uh, in a really innovative way, as, as do a lot of cartoonists, you know, and, and that was just me kind of goofing around. And, and But it has to work. Like, it has to narratively work. You have to be able to follow the panels. And I think that works here. I just wanted to show an example of that. And I think I have another page, uh, Fox Art. These are double page spreads as well. But uh, the Fox gets hit by this guy called the Gasser, and it gets a little psychedelic. Uh, and I think, was that Escher kind of, you know, uh, me mm -hmm. ripping off Escher yeah. to the left and to yeah. the right, you know, again, kind of like a Will Eisner-esque type thing where landscape is a character, you know, mm -hmm. and just being able to play with that. Mm -hmm. Next. And of course, I'm just showing examples. Of, uh, I, I, again, I've had a very uh, robust career working uh, for a bunch of publishers. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. But again, I'm just trying to show like, this is a character I did, I created called the Red Hook uh, about a, a superhero or an anti-hero in Red Hook, Brooklyn, where I, my studio is. And I've been visiting uh, Red Hook for about 25 years now. And it became uh, something, a, a real important place for me. Um, but uh, yeah, this is just some examples of, of the Red Hook versus the Iron Knee and the Possum and creating my own characters that are kind of an homage and a love letter to the superhero genre that I love so much. Mm. Next. More Red Hook. And, and to speak to like, I, I feel like I'm kind of like the brute of the bunch here because I literally just wanted, I just fell in love with the superhero genre and, and my dream because when I would open up a comic book, you would see this assembly line. There was the writer, the penciler, the inker, the letterer, the colorist, the editor. And I thought I was only allowed to be one of those. So my dream was to grow up to pencil the Fantastic Four one day, right? And then I discovered Harvey Picar and Chester Brown, who did a comic called Yummy Fur. 
And then I discovered more underground alternative comics. And I realized, oh, wait, you can write and draw as well. Oh, but wait, you can create your own characters. And furthermore, you could write and draw about your life. That just blew my mind as a kid. You know, I didn't know that. I didn't know that that was okay and possible. So little by small, as I was learning that, I started to add that to my toolbox until I was confident enough to try to write again, realizing I was writing through drawing. And with this character, the red hook, um, basically it's about a, 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 a super thief that's forced to become a superhero against his will, or he will die during a time where Brooklyn reveals herself to be sentient uh, and is so heartbroken by the toxicity of the world that she decides to literally and physically secede from New York, ergo America, to start her own republic where art uh, can be bartered for food and services, which again, is just like a wild dream, you know? Uh, and I wrote and drew four and a half seasons this, of this on the Webtoons platform, but I also published it in print through Image Comics, which I'll show you an example of. Is there a little bit more, Peter? Yeah, of course. This is just more of uh, examples of, of pages from the Red Hook, from the series I did for, four, uh, for about five years. Mm -hmm. Character called the Purple Heart, War Cry, Star Cross. Mm -hmm. And again, this is all available uh, online to read for free at Webtoon. Now, you might be familiar with a character called Deadpool from Marvel Comics. I just quickly wanted to know, because I know we're going to might talk about process, just quickly to show my process. So here's a page. This is me writing a script where it's like panel one with a description, a character dialogue, panel two, description, character dialogue, so on and so forth. Then the next slide, if you can make that a little bigger, if it's possible. Um, that's a thumbnail layout to the left. And that literally is about three inches tall. And the reason why I try to lay out so small is because of clarity. If there's narrative clarity that small, then it's totally going to work when I draw it uh, at 10 inches by 15 inches, 15 inches tall. To the right is the pencils. And then uh, the next page is the inks. And then the colors were colored by Joe and Fanari. And it starts to come together. And so like, this is my normal process. And I think there's one more page with the lettering on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's like a final page. And that's, you know, working for Marvel Comics, right? Uh, but I, have, I am a one-stop shop. Like I, I can do, a, you know, soup to nuts. Everything, the coloring, like this is something I did, uh, a Red Hook pinup. But if you go to the next page, Peter. So just quickly go through this, because this is how I drew the first chapter of the Red Hook. Okay, and those first three pages up to this fourth page, I'm gonna show you in the vertical scroll how I made that work as a vertical comic. So this is a traditional comic page. And then when you get to the vertical scroll and you can make it bigger and start at the top, I was making two comics at the same time, one for eventual print, but one for this vertical scroll. And in the vertical scroll, as he's doing right now, I, I separated the, um, the text out of the boxes uh, of the panels and put them in between. Sometimes the, the, the dialogue would invade the balloon. But Peter, if you go back up for a minute and just start at the beginning, I just wanna show like those flags and how they slowly, these three pages, keep going a little bit more and then you're breaking it up with the lettering. You get some landscape close up. And then you see this part right here with the Manhattan Bridge, the street is cracking and it looks like it's going into this kind of explosion of Delhi, and then this little stone hits the red hook on the head. That's four pages of print comics that looks like one seamless kind of vertical scroll. So those were some of the things that I was trying out, learning how to, how to play with this format. And then I think that's it. And then I can quickly read a little red hook story that kind of merges uh, my love of superhero and memoir. If you can you can do it in, that. in, that's, in, in the, that's the, the currency of community. Um, can you do it super quick, Dean? Because I'm I'm afraid of uh, or we time. can we can skip it if you don't want to. I mean, no, no. I mean, it it's a yeah, yes, it's short. Time. It's short. Okay. All right, I might have to put on my glasses. Okay. Uh, the currency of community. We were in the iris of the virus. In a matter of days, I went from trading fisticuffs with crooks to delivering bags of food to the needy, including my favorite neighbor Pearl. All of a sudden, I hear clapping. Oh, you're just gonna, yeah. 
One pair of hands turned to a theater of clapping. The applause echoed off the buildings. Was this some kind of warning? People were pumping their fists and hollering. Was there going to be an air raid? Pearl needs food. When I got upstairs, I placed the food in front of Pearl's door, knocked three times and stepped back six feet. It was our routine. She opened the door and started clapping. Was she infected? Was clapping a new system, a symptom of the disease spreading? Why is everyone clapping? Are we in danger? Didn't you see the news? No, what's going on? We're clapping for you. Me? Why me? For everything you're doing. The first responders, volunteers, cooks, clerks, delivery, mail, cops, doctors, nurses, teachers, bodegas, risking your lives to save ours every day. You're all heroes. My knees felt wobbly and I slid against the wall far enough away from Pearl so I couldn't infect her in case I had it. Oh, sorry. There was a sorry. rally to... There was a rally to, oh, I see this, this is, okay. There was a rally to organize a two minute citywide appreciation at seven o'clock. And then he slides, okay. Oh, sorry, it's backwards. Well, where are we? <laughs> no, no. What happened? This, wait, we're right here. Okay. It didn't occur to me until I, that moment how exhausted I was, how scary the world had become, the pandemic, the quarantine, the people, the good and the bad. Thank you. No, thank you. One more delivery to go before the night shift starts. Team Terry is two blocks away. He makes a mean pasta <laughs> All right. All right, there thank you go. Thank you. All right. Um, well, uh, thank you all for the incredibly generous presentations. Uh, I have to c confess that I am concerned about time. So I had seven questions, but I think I'm just going to boil it down to one. And then I, I would like to maybe open it up to uh, the myriad students who I'm sure are chomping at the bit to ask you a question. And so um, this question is, is, is pretty, and, and faculty, of course. So all of you have a really manifestly uh, political dimension to your work. And I'm very curious, do you start out with this as you work, you know, very much in mind? Or does this political aspect enter into your work as you concern yourselves with other matters? Maybe things that are kind of quotidian and everyday. How do you navigate this? Because I think this often comes up in, especially in a, in a charged moment like, like ours, you know, for, for artists, especially in, in graduate school, this comes up quite a bit, the kind of politicity involved in, in practice. So would, would you maybe just go in, you know, in order and address this, how this interfaces with your practice? Bishak, do you wanna? Sure, I mean, um, I guess it's, uh, I feel a burden of, re uh, of representation to some degree, but also it's something that's built into my, uh, into my practice, it's like I I started out by not knowing who I was, and then once I sort of realized who I was, I felt like I had to keep telling people that there are more people like me out there, um, and to put more brown, South Asian, trans people on the comics page. And uh, I don't. I said burden initially, but um, I think of it. I think of it more as an opportunity. Uh, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, it's like, it, you know, it's like, it's, it becomes more and more natural the more I do it, right? I wanna write stories about people like me and my sisters and siblings who are brown and trans. So it, it's, uh, it's becoming more and more organic, I guess, the more I do uh, my, my work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Mark, 
Oh, or, or I'm sorry, Emil, I think let, let's go in, in order. Um, no? I, I, I don't, I'm not even sure I can answer that question particularly well. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think I ever begin politically, uh, actually. I begin mm -hmm. with characters and I know that the characters are going to encounter the world as people do. Um, mm -hmm. And I've seen them because, you know, I've experienced the, the struggles of the people in my family and others who um, maybe were different and uh, myself, you know. Um, I, I think I, I believe this one thing and uh, it, it, it kind of makes everything difficult. And that is that I believe that anybody who, well, I believe we're always praying. I believe mm -hmm. that everything we do is a prayer. And uh, the prayer is not necessarily to a God, but um, you, could, you could see it differently than that. Uh, I think even in the midst of hate, people are making a statement about what they um, want, that they want something to come into their lives and teach them. Uh, even as cruel as they might be, I think that they're appealing to a, a universal sense of justice, even in their mm -hmm. cruelty. And I think that that means that I have to operate uh, as a guide, even when the people who are doing things are doing them to me, and even when they hurt me. And so from that perspective, I don't like to create villains. Uh, I don't create villains because I don't believe there are really villains. Even uh, at the worst moments in history, there are simply mm -hmm. people who are doing things um, out of a desire to understand who they are and also um, to build empathy and to be, to be whole. I think that we're all on that journey, uh, even when we present ourselves into the world in a way that is uh, very opposite to that. So I'd never start politically, I start with a human struggle and it is my struggle. I am flawed. I am just a real uh, fuck up. <laughs> and so I, uh, I, I do that. And, uh, and then the political just follows. It, it's mm -hmm. just a part of, because like they say, everything is political. So um, mm -hmm. it's about the power dynamic a lot of the time for people and about how they experience the world. And um, the best choices are the, are the hard ones, you know? So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And anyway, uh, that's me. That's all I've got for you. I probably got more, but it, 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 I'm meandering. I'm at the meandering. No, no, that, yeah. that, that, that's, that's, no, that's wonderful. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and Mark? Um, I would say that it, it was something that for me, I guess with politics and my work, it, I, I, I think I tried to touch it when I was younger. And then it was like kind of like third rail, like, don't touch that. Don't you ever touch that. Like, you want to be an artist in this world? Never touch that shit. Mm -hmm. So then it was like, but it was just how I thought, you know, it's how I, the conversations I had, how I formed my reality was talking about what was going on around me. Now, if that becomes politics or that's what it's called, you know, that's what it is. But I think it's just sort of like, how can I not think about what I'm thinking about or, or, or what I'm interacting with? I felt like everything else, it felt like that was a fiction to me, you know, mm -hmm. like that was made up or that was like bizarre or that was a choice. Mm -hmm. but like what I started thinking about when I just wanted to generate things that that's how it comes out and it's only and I think that the, the thing that always kind of forced me away from it originally was this idea of timelessness and this idea of like no don't you want to make something as timeless and it was like well if it's an empty vessel then it will be timeless and it's like well no actually that's not how it works you know like if you understand the history of, an, of a painting or an image or, or, or even looking back at comics that we have now in the last like 100 years or so, the context of its time, you learn something, you have to think about it, it evolves. So mm -hmm. now even looking at things that I've done maybe two, three years ago, people will look at it and be like, oh my God, I totally forgot about that shit. Like, I can't believe that happened. Like that's, a, that's another like line of thinking and perspective to reality that it offers. So, um, but yeah, it's like I, it's my, it's just, it's a kind of my personality, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. And, and Dean, how about you? I mean, you have a, a very kind of symbolic, um, allegorical perspective in many ways. Um, so, but, but the work is deeply political. I mean, Brooklyn secedes from uh, Manhattan, art is currency, there's, uh, you know, epic struggles over, over ethics and the value of creativity. 
Yeah, I mean, when you say it like that, it's absolutely political. I never even approach it that way. I, I approach when I'm writing what I draw, because I've drawn other people's stories, as you know, what uh, my concerns are human connection and love. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the thing that is most important is to try to foment, you know, uh, love through misunderstood situations, misunderstood monsters. I mean, my favorite character at Marvel Comics is the thing from the Fantastic Four. Like, mm. what a tragedy. But, you know, and how to prevail through that, you know. And, uh, you know, uh, Emil, like, you know, I love, I have drawn a werewolf. I have drawn a werewolf, everybody, myself. <laughs> just so you know. And it's not I'll a competition. That <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but that's another thing. Monsters are transformative. Like, sure. it, it, like you know, especially like a werewolf where like yeah. what, once a month you turn into a werewolf, right? Basically, um, that's a great metaphor. And that's true for all of us, mm -hmm. you know? Um, although I may be more than once a month. Um, but anyway, uh, that's what I love to write and draw because you know, when you're sitting there, especially as you get older and you, you, you really start to experience time in a different way, how you use it, mm -hmm. you know, what is it that we're trying to leave behind? What is what are the stories so that, you know, when I'm long gone, hopefully someone could pick up something I, I made and get a little understanding of what I cared about. That's what I'm starting to write and draw more so nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Um, well, you know, I, I did have six more um, very, very insightful questions, but I, I think for for. Um, lack of time, we should we should open it up to the great forum that is the Leslie community. And uh, first one up is my great nemesis in this community, Oliver Wasso. Uh, so Oliver, you have <laughs> you have a question. Uh, well, first of all, Peter, thank you uh, so much yeah. for putting together mm -hmm. really a, a great, uh, much needed and, and wonderful panel. Of course, thank you to all the panelists for being here. Um, I'll try to make it quick. And I, you know, I, I think there's some students now with hands up, so I, um, which I didn't see before, I would have deferred to them. So uh, I'll try to make it quick and then you don't all have to answer this question. Anybody who's interested could, but one of the things that is so useful about a panel like this um, is of course, we spend a lot of time in, in this program talking about, you know, the, the, the high-low conversation. Um, and often that's the way comics are framed within sort of the art world, whether it's, you know, Warhol, Lichtenstein and in pop or what have you, it's almost seen as a sort of uh, uh, an elevation of this medium to high art. When in fact, as what's apparent looking at what all of you have done is, is that, you know, this is in fact um, art itself. And I guess the thing that I'm more interested in is the way in which what you guys do intersects with so many other different uh, disciplines and media, so, so, so much other media that is happening right now and is influenced by and influences, whether it's video games or, or, or film or um, illustration, painting itself, probably even you know, photography and new you know, digital 3D imaging programs and stuff. So I'm just wondering, and I'm sorry if this is too vague a question, but kind of how do you guys navigate that space? Like, how, how, are you influenced by things that are static? Do you, you know, do you think of your work in terms of print or in terms of the screen? Uh, you know, is it drawing? Are you more sort of in the digital realm? I'm sure you all have, you know, different answers to this. So. Oliver, can I read? Can I rephrase that? Because you are my you always nemesis. Do, Peter, and you always do it well. No, because this is actually one of my questions. And this is this is what my version sounds like. What influence from fine arts or other spheres do you feel make it into your comics work and or practice? Well, okay. Is that similar? Uh, yeah, that's fine. That's good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I may, uh, comics yeah. is a is a multimedia yeah. is a multimedia <laughs> medium. You're constantly taking from other sources. But it's equally, at least the way I view it, a reductive uh, form where you're reducing and trying to boil down uh, in, into a, a, a sense of clarity, you know, story, you know. Um, but we all approach it differently. And I think, 
you know, what's very helpful to everybody is deadlines. So also finding your shorthand, you know, is, is I think very important or you'll just sit there all day pulling from all sources, trying to figure out how to make this look this way or say it that way. So trying to find the, the, and honing in on what, you know, uh, the best way to exploit your own virtues, you know? Uh, but like, yeah, theater, movies, prose, music. I listen to music all the time and it can, it can like steer the way I draw something, you know? But I'm not sitting there figuring out how that's happening. I'm just absorbing and then expressing as best mm -hmm. as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think often when I tell people that I'm like looking at like Holbein or something like that, like people are like, what? You know, I'm like, yeah, that's kind of where I, I, I go at it. It's like, also, I'm just all, I, I was gonna, I was gonna say like, for me, it's line. Like I'm a line junkie. So like, if I just see good line, if I go off into a store and I'm looking at books, I'm just like looking for lines. I'm looking for inking. I'm looking for marks. I'm looking for like thinking. And also, yeah, what you're saying about the shorthand or the uh, refinement thing, like how did someone get out of that? How did someone like, like figure it out? Like that page, like how do they figure it out? Like how do they just make it so clear and just run through it? When did, where did they decide to dedicate the energy in certain places to really emphasize and raise something up? And does that meet the does that meet the the stakes of what they formed before it? Now, like when we think about like a Lichtenstein and think about like what those image that imagery represents and what it could be saying about romance, what it could be saying about warfare, what it could be saying about politics, you know, the idea that these things are in mass culture and the way that we're seeing these things and this elevation onto the painting wall, you know, like it seems more like to me that that's a um, a conceptual project much more than it's often offered or, or spoken about. Um, knowing sight and knowing representation and knowing the image that you're like placing inside of that site and knowing how that site, that site is actually how things move in that. But I think that I keep thinking outside of like the condemnation of the art of, of comics in the 1950s, like, was it really that bad that it affected it so much in America that why other cultures, it doesn't seem to have so much of a, a decline. Like, really? Like, that's kind of crazy. And, mm. um, but now that, you know, I, I found that I got all of a sudden I could teach comics in a school as soon as Marvel movies started making a billion dollars. It was like, all of a sudden it was like, we need a comics class. And it was like, it was like, really? Like, come yeah. on. And, and, you know, and also when dealing with printmaking, thinking about like Japanese, like prints and thinking about different cultures and printmaking and the history of that, comics have been around forever. So it's like the fact that it couldn't be taught or why it isn't move and flow that way or the high low the in and out that's something it's a very complicated thing mm. well, what uh, i love what you just said by the way mark and i just wanted to kind of build on it a little bit um what happens when we find out that um the first art the first fine art was comics because it it, it was and it is and you know there's this moment when you're watching uh you're in the lascaux caves and there was a movie made recently about them. And you realize that the way the, the caves worked is that they would put these images on these very narrow pathways, which would create danger just to look upon them. So you're, you're leading people through this and you've got a, a torch maybe. And so you're in this dangerous passageway where you can fall to your death while you're looking at this image. So you've heightened the level of fear and it's an experience because it's this full wall image and you know a story is being told at that moment. So you've got text or words and image happening at the same time. This is ancient. This is what we've always done. Fine art is the grandchild of comics. Okay, I'm gonna say that to you now and I'm, and, and I'm gonna tell you if you didn't believe me then go yeah. watch a silent film and understand that that is comics in film form and what follows it is is uh, is audio it's yeah. it's the film we have now that yeah. is the original uh, that's the comics of film and yeah. it is the original and we are really we're drawing from the the source we are drawing from yeah. the old vampires. That's that's who we get our blood from. And and yeah. you know when fine art wants to talk to me about this we can have that conversation. It's not 
going to come out well for fine art. <laughs> Sorry about that. Although Neil, you are you are you are so clearly informed by by painting and especially pre twentieth well, we century painting. Well, yeah. We all are. We yeah. all are. We yeah. all are. But but mm. what came first? What came first, in my opinion, was the desire to tell the story. The story mm. was paramount once, mm -hmm. and fine art decided it was going to divorce itself from the story. But it never did, because if you want to engage anyone with fine art and they walk into a museum and they look at a Francis Bacon painting and they say, that's terrifying, you tell them what his studio was like and how he got horse whipped out of his ancestral family home for being a gay man. And all of a sudden there's quiet and everybody wants to see this painting and really study it because the story engendered something in them. And that's, mm -hmm. and that's what comics is. And that's mm -hmm. what we are. And you know what? Um, it's just a flow. It's a long, long flow. It's a long parade mm -hmm. of joy. But uh, comics was first. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. No. No. I, I, hey, hey I, I'm a convert. You know. <laughs> um, Bijak, do you want to add anything to this before we move on to other questions? Sure. Um, I'll, I was just saying it's interesting what um, Dean said about um, you know uh, the reductive quality of comics and how that's like. Um, primary and I sort of contrast that with Emile's approach to rendering um, comics, which is, I mean, I, I, I hesitate to say maximalist, but like the, the intense cross hatching and I mm. goes back to, you know, our discussion about fine art. So I think there's a, there's kind of a balance of both, right? It's sort of like, I think Emile's work is sort of anti McLeodian in the sense that it doesn't reduce everything to icons, right? It's like fully, sort of fleshed out and that's even that's to its benefit because it's so the, the work is so visceral right um mm -hmm. as as for print first or like uh, paper and like old school stuff versus digital i'm i'm strictly old school um mm -hmm. taught at sva i my final project for my students was to do a mini comic none of them had ever done a mini comic mm -hmm. and i made them do this i mean this is an old this is not one of their uh, mini comics but they went through this process and it was like wow what a transformative sort of experience it's great right um but i yeah that's the world i like to live in because i'm um uh as far as like influences from outside comics um music is something i agree with um on uh, with dean on i music informs a lot of my older work lately i've been a very influenced by dance uh i love going to see modern dance and i'm trying to incorporate a lot of uh, the idea of like how the stage is almost like a panel, you know, a panel within which bodies are moving. And that, you can see that in a lot of my paintings, but I'm trying to bring that into my comics work too. Wonderful. All right. Uh, so uh, Kelly, I believe you have a question in the, in the chat, correct? Um, yes, I had posted a question. Um, Emil was yes. gracious enough to, um, to address that, but I, um, I'm a high school art teacher and I have a lot of students that draw um, characters from, you know, shows or graphic novels that they love. And, you know, obviously I encourage that, that practice and trying to get them to kind of take that leap into originality and to come up, like create their own stories. They seem to struggle to kind of get over the edge. And I think I said ledge in my question, but <laughs> I was just kind of wondering, you know, if there was, some piece of advice, some resource that someone gave you at some point that really kind of made that click and allowed you to sort of take that leap from copying to creating your own original stories. And I know some of that has to do with just being in touch with your own story and being able to um, speak to it. And, you know, they're high school students, so they're still trying to kind of figure out who they are. But I guess I was just looking for some you know, a little key piece of advice or resource or something that you found that kind of helped you um, as a young person kind of give you that little nudge that you needed. It's, it's, a, it's quite a conundrum, isn't it? Because like in this day and age of like, um, you know, Instagram reels and stuff, people love to talk about themselves. I mean, that's their primary focus. So why is it so hard for them to then translate that into another medium like comics? Um, 
that's a question. I don't have an answer, but it is it is a bit of a paradox, right? But I think that's a really good question to start off with, though, if you're trying to prompt students into thinking about telling their own narrative, is that you have this one space where you feel comfortable to kind of generate content and off and like even perform to that that to that space. So why in the space where it comes to rendering something, you choose not to, or you just crib off of something else. But also that cribbing part, I think, is a part of learning how to work with the line. You know, it's like, what was it? I don't know if this is true, but I always heard the story that like if you started working at Marvel back in the day, you were put under like, you know, two different people like Kirby and um, the guy did uh, Dick Ditko. And you basically like learn how to draw tracing their work. And so, you know, because there was a style that was in play. But I remember years ago also that with students who used to draw like manga, um, like that was like a big no-no. And so like if a kid was applying to an art school, it was like, no, you're out. But then now it's like a, so much a part of the culture. It's like, you wouldn't even think about it. So I guess there, I would say like, maybe there's an embracing point where like you let them generate and try to draw maybe, I think your question, what you said um, was it incredible because I hadn't even thought about the Instagram part, but like the, uh, but like, yeah, like, okay, fine. You're gonna do a Yu-Gi-Oh comic, do it, you know? But like, what's gonna go on in the storyline? Like what's actually happening in there? Or like maybe they end up telling a story that they don't, those characters can't function within. Kind of coming off what um, Emil said, um, you know, where the character just isn't functional because the story and the character and the emotions that are occurring, those characters can't hold that. That can happen too. Hmm. I think as an, uh, a, a fun exercise maybe is to ask, a question that the that the they have to draw the answer to or create a dilemma possibly you know of sorts um and another thing is as i mentioned before uh you could give all five of us peter too like a script and it could just be a paragraph this is what D uh, david greenberger was a writer who did something called duplex planet illustrated and he would interview old people in an old folks home and it would just be a simple little paragraph or two essay and I remember he would say, what is this, two, three pages? I'm like, what are you talking about? Where's the panel breakdown with the description and the dialogue? And there was none of that. So that was where I had to like, I was challenged to be a writer as an artist and to figure that out. And it was pretty broad, this, um, you know, uh, uh, challenge. And so, but it made me think about story, right? Mm -hmm. So what you could do is come up with or find something that they would all be challenged for as a homework assignment or something where like, turn this into one page of comics and then you'll get all these different versions, right? And then you can discuss what works or what doesn't work or whatever. And then after a while, you know, create, create a question or a dilemma that, that has to be answered or put them into a position, right? Or back them in a corner that they have to get out of, you know? Um, Mark Wade is, is, a, is a, a big time um, a comic book writer a, a superhero comic book writer and he was writing daredevil for many issues and every the end of a lot of issues there was this crazy cliffhanger and i would go how is he going to get out of that right and i asked mark how are you you know he's like i don't know i write that cliffhanger not knowing how they're going to get out. so it i excite myself as a writer and try to figure it out right yeah, so i don't know cool. those, you know th those are good little challenges and then it activates the brain and then you start, you know, they, if they're creating a character, whether it's them or not, you know, uh, it, they'll, they'll want to keep following that journey, you know, kind of a thing. So, yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I love that Mark so Wade run. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was great. Um, yeah. So we're going to give the last question to, to uh, John Vincent, who's been very patient. Um, and um, John, are you still with us? I am. Yes. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody. Um, I'm a first year MFA student, and I'm so glad that I uh, jumped on board with this, um, especially the talk about the werewolves. I'm actually making real, or not real, but uh, making werewolves for a feature film. It's, I'm a monster maker is one of the things I do. So what the question that I have is, even though I've been in this business for a long time, in terms of art, uh, I've always had this felt that I was looked at uh, with something not quite legitimate in the art world. 
um, because of the type of stuff that I created. And I didn't know, I wondered what, how, if you had the same kind of feeling and if you did, if you did, how did, how did you get past that? Uh, you're talking about validation. Basically. Yes. Who cares? Oh, Who damn. I don't care. I'm doing because I love it. Yeah. Sorry, I don't need a badge. I don't need a gold star. I need somebody to buy it if I want to make a living at it. But who? I don't care. I don't care if Peter likes my work or not. I'm going to hey. make it. Hey. <laughs> I'm right here, dude. <laughs> right here. Hey. Like, 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 listen. Yeah, that, that's the bottom line. Of course, you want people to like, you know, like you and your stuff or whatever, right? But that's not everybody i mean look at our world you know and there are people out there that want are looking to hate don't even pay attention to those people you know being a new yorker and such a street fighter yeah. <laughs> i completely appreciate that i on the other hand have a dark other side that i have to do battle with constantly and so i will answer that question from the perspective of the loser of those battles because I lost that battle for so many years with myself. And that was that, I mean, I came to comics so late because I said, well, I wanna make fine art. And, and yet I was constantly making comics. And, and so finally one day I said, you know, I'm not gonna have that battle with myself, but the truth is I do every day. And I think you, you have that battle and that's okay. Have it, but make the work anyway. I would agree with what you're saying, Dean, just make the work anyway and and because you know what you love and so uh you know wait for them to catch up with you because they will ultimately i think thank you I'd, i would agree with that that sentiment and it's like yeah you you it's like you can't leave from behind you know like you got to just kind of make the work and then you'll find the people with you you know like there's um Another thing that the teacher told us, the one who said, you know, skin the game was just that, like, you know, there's many different art worlds. And that's the problem is that there's a lot of different art worlds. And the problem is that there's certain art worlds that become very, very prominent. And, and the whole part of that art world is the fact that it's in your face all the time. So then you start to compare and despair against that space. But what you're doing has nothing to do with that whatsoever. Not at all. So it's mm. like, so you can start to deal, you start to delegitimize what you're doing because you think that you're in that game and you're actually not even playing in that game. You're playing cricket. You no, know, like they're over there playing like, you know, hopscotch. So like, you got to like understand the space that you actually are in because you might even understand that in your space that the former reception isn't in the visual, but it might be in the verbal. It's about word of mouth. Like in the comic book world, like one thing I found when I started meeting people in that space, they were givers. They would tell you things. They would express things. They would show you things. In the fine art world, it's more like secret society. Like, man, I don't know, maybe you know, <laughs> you know, you know. There's only there's only one wall in the world, and I have to be on it. You know, like that's that's yeah. that space. Yeah. So like, so so if you're looking for validation in that thing, you know, it's like it's made to make you want to have to, to succeed in that space. That's mm -hmm. again part of the the network of the, the it's it's built baked into the pie, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John, John, I would say like in 2022, um, the cultural landscape, the zeitgeist has changed so much that um, in the world of like, you know, the Marvel Comics universe and a world where people, where we're wolves and monsters are like, you know, we have discussions about, about such things that um, are culturally validated, but also are appreciated by like a vast sort of swath of people um, where in a cultural landscape when people know who Art Spiegelman is or, you know, Satrapi or Chris Ware or, you know, um, you know, people, Black Panther is a legit, totally legit cultural phenomenon and everyone is on board. That is huge validation and that all comes from comics. That's like, that's our visual world. That's comics. That's like a kind of low culture that, that spawned this whole, like, uh, this like vast cultural landscape of 2022. So I would say the only people who are trying to delegitimize you are a tiny little coterie of like this big of whoever they are. I don't know who they are, these haters, but like, you know, what I, I can't even name them, but why bother listening? Because everyone else is on board. 
Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, I feel like that's a great resounding and inspiring note to end on, Bijak. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you from really the bottom of my heart. I think uh, many students here, they, they have put it in the chat, but I will hear from them as well. This has been massively inspirational. I thank you eternally for your immense generosity. I think you will have many converts into the world of sequential art and graphic novels. You have blasted open people's horizons to forge these new, new channels of interdisciplinarity. And I look forward to continuing the conversation in whatever way we can. And, you know, I want to take you all out for drinks, but let's alas, do it. Oh my God. Uh, but I think we'll make it happen. So next time we all converge in New York, it's on me and IRL y'all. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you everyone. <laughs> Have a great night. Right. night. Thanks so much. <laughs>